Every time after 15, 20 seconds elapse, people sense there's something wrong. So mm. they automatically start applauding you and yeah, say, yeah, yeah. come on, you can you do can it, do you, it. Can, you can do it. And that's when I bust out the Abdul Halim Hafiz song, yeah. right? So it's like, Adina Yeshu Adina. And they're like, what the <coughs> hell? Carry on, carry on. I have it's allergies. A, it's a TikTok clip. I need, I need the whole yeah, song. I need a little, a little bit more. Come on. Adina Yeshu Adina. One Ho Chang, welcome, welcome, welcome home. Thank you for welcome, having welcome me. I feel like house. we're friends before we even met in right? real life. Yeah. So now that you say that, I think the best way to kind of let people understand our relationship is if I get on that screen now, I just bring up our WhatsApp thread. <laughs> no, 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 no. I think we, that will like really, really let people know what kind of relationship we have. We got too comfortable too right? fast. <laughs> way too fast. Do you think people should know how we know each other? Or about the popcorn? Oh, no, 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 the, 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 not the other. real story. <laughs> oh, okay. The fake okay. make believe story. Yeah, yeah. How my sister is good friends with your wife. Yeah. And she used to work with your wife. But back in the days when she wasn't married to you yeah, yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now you're married to this yeah. person who is my sister's friend. So I this mean, is our the, connection. There goes all of my, you know, fans that thought I weren't married. Thanks for that. Wah, wah, you know, wah, people wah. who thought that they had a chance. <laughs> <laughs> now they're all Sorry. just like, well, I'm not following this guy anymore. <laughs> Bloody waste of time. No, yeah, it's a small world, huh? Yeah, very small world. It's a world. crazy small world. Yeah. And I actually remember messaging you when I first started the podcast to get on. And you must have looked at it and gone, yeah, mate, nine followers. No, no thanks. I'll tell you and what. And then you messaged me back again. Now you were like, okay, okay, he, he's earned it now. I'm gonna I, come I wish it was that. You know what it. happened? So on Instagram, you know how you go to your messages area, and then you have primary, primary, general, the, and then the others, and then the kids, the and then it says all requests. Yeah, yeah. So I think it was I don't know two weeks ago when we messaged. I realized that next to all requests, there's another button, and it says top requests. Ah, oh, okay. Do you know that? No, I didn't know that. I was like, what is top requests? So now it's basically the people who are either have big numbers or are, or are your peers, or people something. who are verified, yeah. So all these messages started appearing from 2015 onwards. Wow. And I'm like, what is, th like hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of messages from people. Like, uh, like there was a Kuwaiti actress that sent me a message when I did the Musalsal back in 2016. She's like, sent me a message. And I was like, oh my God, seven years later, I replied to her. So your message wow. was one of them. And I spent two days. The first day was an hour, and then I couldn't go through all of it. And then the next day, I spent, I think, three or four hours in bed replying to, you know, the messages that matter, right? Yeah, yeah. Because some people have no picture. Because if you have... don't have a blue tick, you don't matter. To it don't nobody, matter, bitches. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you gotta have the blue where tick, you are, right? Yeah. No, it's not like that. I'm, no, I'm not I mean, like I that. I call bullshit on all of that story, but it was a nice. <laughs> it was a nice way of letting me down. Okay, you, but, you know, know what? Look, I prefer to take it as I earned my stripes. No, but you don't. And you, I was welcomed as a peer instead <laughs> no, no, of just no. some guy. You will get to know how <laughs> yeah, yeah. honest I am as a yeah. person because this is a quality that I look in that I look for in anyone that I meet or mm. anyone that I would like to hang out with. So if I'm out and about in Dubai, and in Dubai you have, you meet a mix of people. You know, you meet mm. good people someday, you meet bad people someday, bad people some days. And when I go out and I meet somebody that I like and I like their energy and I like how they talk and I, I love how honest they are. I would make it a point to say, how can I stay in touch with you? Mm. Let's let's hang out. Let's do stuff. Because I think the same way an art curator has artwork that he or she or they like in that space, you curate your life as well. You bring in people into your life that add to it, whether by their humility, their honesty, their their humor, their intellect, their wealth, yeah, their, yeah, right? whatever it is. Yeah, you know, yeah. like you, I think you have to always bring something to the table. Otherwise what's 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 why are you friends with this person you basically just kind of rip 
wrote a script for a haunted horror movie like you're collecting humans <laughs> in the back shed right so that's yeah, what you are i'm curating other human beings and then, you kill and then yeah right and in the end that's why when we go into your house i'm sure there's gonna be a couple of people just hanging from the wall right and stuff like that so i really liked him he had great energy so i vacuum sealed him and put him up on the wall i don't know it's not a room i have a long they corridor, a long corridor with, like, right kind of like this one that's there yeah right? exactly and yeah. then there the other ones like my office i have a few heads on top of my desk yeah. and everything's nice so look Let's talk about the camel in the room. I mean, <laughs> in Europe, it would be an elephant. But since we're in, in Dubai, we'll call it the camel. Um, I initially first heard about you from my, at the time, 60-year-old mum. Really? Yeah. So I don't know if you know about Arab women and WhatsApp groups. They have probably about 4,000 WhatsApp groups. Uh -huh. And there's probably about... 2.3 million other Arab mums in those groups sending videos to everyone. Mm -hmm. Like no matter what, whatever they think is funny, even to the point that you get that good morning picture. With the flowers. With the flowers and the, bird, and the, the glitter and the bird. And it has music. Yeah, yeah, it has, it has the glitter. Khair, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. It has music on it, but it doesn't move at all. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So she sent it in the group. And I remember thinking, like looking at it and going, the reason why it was even more impressive was not because you spoke Arabic. It's because you spoke Arabic, Arabic. Yeah. Like there was no accent. There was no Korean, Vietnamese twang in it. It was, it was straight up Arabic. Yes. And let's talk about how you got that. And I will say in Arabic you know. Uh, بحب اقول لكم انه انا uh, صوتي غريب وضلني اعمل لانه uh, عندي حساسيه يعني كل كل ست اشهر بدبي بتحسس بيجيني حساسيه من الغبره او من الجو or something so uh, اعذروني we're gonna hear that hmm. a lot so that they know what's going on how do you say bat in arabic bat what what okay <laughs> How do I say Wuhan in Arabic? <laughs> I just, I'm just saying it's got nothing to do with the fact that he's Asian at all. Yeah, I know you, <laughs> right? I it's know you so how well. You already do, right? Yeah, I okay. know you. And this is the first time we meet in person. But I'm telling you, do you know what the thing that I'm saying? That all the guests that I'm talking about, you're better than me. Subhanallah. But from all the guests that came to the show, if one is cool, so he can let me talk in Arabic. That's so strange. This is globalization, and I think the world. Uh, I'll go back to your question, yeah, but yeah. the world as it is today, I feel like you're gonna get more and more of this. Like it's such a globalized world, and mm. then people like us will become the norm. And the people mm. who have come from a from a village where both parents were from that village, and and they can trace their ancestry back to that village, like 19 generations back. I think people like us will be the the future, like super mixed. And for me, when people ask me where you're from, I would say I'm Korean, Vietnamese, born in Saudi, raised in Jordan, living in Dubai. There's no shorter way to uh, to to answer mm. that question because I'm not Korean, because there are other parts as well. I'm not just Vietnamese. I'm not just Jordanian. I'm not just Saudi. I'm not just Emirati or whatever it is. So to answer your question, um, you know what I think? Why my appearance on you know. YouTube and TV uh, struck a chord with people is the fact that, well, it was a Korean guy speaking Arabic, but also a Korean guy speaking Arabic is not the norm. You have Koreans and Vietnamese people who immigrated to Australia and they have become mm. Australian. And, you know, say likewise, Koreans who went to London, they went to the United States. But the Korean diaspora, a lot of people didn't end up in Jordan. And that's where we ended up. So I think it was very interesting in that sense where you had a Korean man and his Vietnamese wife and their two daughters and their youngest son living in Jordan. And we weren't supposed to end up in Jordan. We were supposed to go to Saudi and then immigrate to Uruguay or Paraguay, one okay. of those. And these were the immigration routes for some of the Koreans back then. So I think that's an interesting thing. The second thing was me going up on stage and touring with the Axis of Evil comedy tour. And Shout um, out to them. That shout out to them. Tour. I love them. Ahmad Maz yeah, yeah. Aaron. And, um, you know, I was hired to be a behind the scenes presenter for Showtime Arabia back then, which is now called OSN. So I was supposed mm -hmm. to be the presenter for the show. And um, we had spent a week prepping for this show and I wasn't supposed to go on stage. The day of our first show, we were embarking on a 30 day, 29 show, five countries tour. It was intense, filmed, then broadcasted later on, on Showtime Arabia. Before the very first show, uh, we were just doing you know sound checks four hours before the show, and uh, 
And the guys came up to me and they said, listen, we really like you. It's been a week. We've been hanging out. We've been like partying together, drinking together. We've been talking. You're a cool guy. You speak Arabic. You sing. You do all these things. They're like, why don't you go up on stage with us tonight? And I said, I don't mind, but what, what am I doing? Were you doing comedy at that stage? No. Oh, okay. I was, my plans back then were to be a TV presenter. Okay. I've always liked that medium and I wanted to present uh, a TV show or have my own talk show or something mm. like that. And um, they said, why don't you join us on stage? And I said, well, I have nothing to say. They said, why don't you sing? And I said, well, it's random because you're doing comedy in English and then you have some like Korean dude singing before your show. It, it doesn't connect. So they had a running joke that said, we are called the Axis of Evil Comedy Tour. We are an Iranian, an Egyptian, and a Palestinian. We're looking for a North Korean to complete the Axis of Evil, right? Mm -hmm. So, and obviously they couldn't find a North Korean, yeah. but that was a joke. Long story short, the head of production at Showtime was buying shoes from the Puma store. This was way before the tour started, like a, a year before. I was at the Puma store as well, buying okay. shoes. And I was making people laugh in Arabic. He heard this and then he, he asked for my number. But it's a really, really, really long story. Yeah. But the story is so serendipitous because I got an opportunity. I joined them. The, the, I got very, I got along very well with these guys, with Aaron, Ahmed, and Maz. Love them. Maz, Maz has been on the podcast before. Really? Yeah, he yeah. is such, he's like a big brother to me, actually. He's always been so... The, the Maz you see on on stage is a different Maz that mm -hmm. you see in person because he's a lot more mellow. Yeah, yeah. Not that he's a different person in character. He's just a lot more mellow. He's serious. Uh, he reads the news. He's very wise. And he he was a person I would go to during that tour to get advice from. Uh, not that I didn't get any advice from Ahmed and Aaron, but just Maz was very like almost fatherly mm -hmm. towards me uh, and from a career perspective. Anyways, so these guys asked me to join them on stage and I said, it's random for me to sing. So they came up with this whole thing that says, we're called the Axis of Evil. We finally found our North Korean, uh, but he doesn't speak Arabic. So just welcome him on stage. So I would go on stage and they would say, you know, say something and I'd start speaking in Korean. And they're like, Habibi, this is the Middle East. So you need to speak in a different language. Mm. And then I try Vietnamese and I try French. And they're like, no, 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 no. They're like, listen, you don't need to speak. Here's a microphone, entertain them for two minutes. I'll be right back. I'm going to the bathroom. And then he leaves me. This was all prepared, of course. And this is how we created that foray for me to mm -hmm. get into that stage world and that entertainment world and the TV world. So I went up on stage and after, you know, acting awkward for a good 30 seconds and people don't know what the fuck's going on, right? They're mm -hmm. like, what the hell? It's amazing. Every time after 15, 20 seconds elapse, people sense there's something wrong. So mm -hmm. they automatically start applauding you and yeah, saying, yeah, yeah. come on, you can you do, can it, do you it. Can, you can do it. And that's when I bust out the Abdul Halim Hafiz song, yeah. right? So it's like, Adina Yeshu Adina. And they're like, what the <laughs> hell? Carry on, carry on. I have it's allergies. A, it's, it's a TikTok a, clip. I need, I need the whole yeah, song. I need a little, a little bit more. Come on. Adina Yeshu Adina Ala barril hawa أنا عمري معك وهوايا هواك عدينا يسوع عدينا لو عايزين birthday parties أو أي حاجة ممكن يجي يعمل يغني على أولولي أولولي so freaking allergies man I sing better والله كورونا so anyways I went up on stage and to answer your question finally I sing this song, I think the the verse, the chorus, two minutes, two and a half minutes. And then people are going nuts. They're like, oh my God. Ah. And then after that, I say, and again, the same shock. It's like, oh my God, what? So they think that I had memorized, they thought I had yeah, memorized, yeah, memorized that song, yeah. but now he speaks it. Yeah. And until recently, I would do shows and this woman came out to me after the show and she was like, I wanted to ask you, you speak Arabic? <laughs> and I said, were you... No, no, I'm just Asian you, and I got <laughs> really good memory. I memorized a whole Yeah, I'm like, show. were you at the show? Yeah, yeah. She's like, yeah, yeah. I was like, the whole show? Like, yeah. She's like, yeah. And I said, what do you think? She's like, yeah, okay, maybe you memorized it. I was like, and there's this, even when I meet people in person and they see me on TV or on social media, they're like, oh, so you actually speak Arabic? Because there's always this thing on social media where it made me tampered with, it might be hmm. a lip sync because now... Yeah, deep, content is deep lip fakes. sync, right? Yeah. You wait to see what I do with this episode. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> yeah. Put a nice face on this right. though. Yeah. 
so yeah, I think it's uh, it's different levels of like uh, surprise for people because you know a Korean speaking Jordanian is not common. Mm. Maybe a Korean speaking living in California speaking you know American English is yeah, more yeah. common. So I think or our even Spanish as well because uh, you know Mexicans there's a very uh, some parts of Mexico have a very Asian look as well. Yeah. So they could that could pass easily and be you'd be like oh he's Mexican. It's that's a great comment actually because when I do shows in Jeddah they are not surprised when I start speaking Arabic because they have a lot of uh, you know uh, people from the far east that moved to Saudi to live there from Indonesia from Malaysia so have they have integrated so they mm. look Asian but they have integrated into the Saudi community. But when I tell them I'm Korean, they're shocked mm. because they are used to seeing an Indonesian, a you know, a, a Malaysian speaking uh, Arabic, Jidawi Arabic, but not a Korean. Mm. So I think that's what's uh, that's what's interesting. I also think I have nice <coughs> cheekbones and nice beautiful teeth. cheekbones. But the thing is, though, you I don't know if I'm just really into comedy, so I notice a lot of things. But you do a lot of crowd work and a lot of improv in your in your things. So I don't understand how they thought that you didn't speak Arabic. Uh, you know it's I mean? surprising. And this is something that I've come to realize with time, you know, whether whether it be like the audience that I have in the theater or the auditorium or people who watch on television or people who watch on social media, you can present something to somebody and everybody sees it in a different way and everybody perceives it in a different way. Some people just look at you. Some people mm. listen to what you're saying. Some people... It's like music, right? Some people listen to the beat. Some people listen to the lyrics. Absolutely. So I think it's that, you know, so maybe she was just like fascinated by my beautiful good looks. And right? she was like, oh my God, you're so mesmerizing. I mean, I'm answer. finding it really hard to kind of keep going with this podcast because right <laughs> I'm, I'm mesmerized. But how... Just lo- don't look directly at me. Just, you know. I have been looking directly at you. <laughs> I've been looking somewhere else, but, but um, I really want to show this WhatsApp thread, but I won't. <laughs> no, <laughs> I won't. don't do it. But how does it, uh, something I want to ask you about. I mean, because I get it. I think I look Arabic. Yeah. But mm. I don't look... Arabic, Arabic, and with this nose, I could be Israeli. You, you never know. Do you know what I mean? Oh, okay. Um, when I was traveling around the world, a lot of Israel- Israelis were speaking to me in there, and I was just like, "Nah, bro, I'm not your, I'm not Israeli." Do you know what I mean? And then I, like, then I tell them my name is Ahmed Muhammad Ali Jabber. They'll yeah. be like, oh, "Okay, no, you're not one of us." And you know what's crazy away. is like, I'll, we'll go back to your question, yeah. but when when I look at the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, hmm. th- there, there's so much history there, and like, th- both sides have similar looks. Right? Yeah, yeah. They have similar looks. So it's insane, right? Yeah. So back to your question. Um, the question was. Um, got you off track. You got me <laughs> off track. So I looked into your eyes again. Something no, about no, no. the looks. Yeah. So yeah. Um, because people get surprised when I speak oh. Arabic in some places, which oh. I find is strange because I think I look Arabic. They, do, they really do kind of like, oh, you speak Arabic, which I yeah. find weird. I'm like, yeah, bro. You know my situation. Oh, I say situation, but my <laughs> upbringing. So I was born here. Raised in London, um, you know, Lebanese parents, never been to Lebanon, then remarried uh, to an Egyptian parent. So spent all my summers there. Like, I don't feel like I belong to anywhere. Okay. Do you know what I mean? I find it very difficult to be patriotic. Like I have some Lebanese friends and they are so patriotic as unbelievable. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? Did you have any trouble with that kind of fitting in or where you belong or when you're growing up? Because you're Arab. You grew yeah. up as an Arab. Yes. Do you know what I mean? But obviously you don't look Arab. So how yes. did you kind of deal with that growing up? And do you now class yourself as an Arab? I Now I do. And I always have because I think my Arabic is, is my native tongue. Hmm. So I express myself better in Arabic. I think in Arabic. I really understand the culture very, very well. And not just like UAE or Jordan. Hmm. I understand the culture overall. overall. Um, and I think... As you get older, you become more comfortable in your skin naturally, right? Yeah. When I was younger is when I had more of an issue because growing up in a Korean-Vietnamese household where if you would walk into our house... There's just critical jail everywhere. Right? <laughs> critical jail! <laughs> critical jail! <laughs> My God! <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm so worried about this like phlegm that I have in my no, chest right fine. now. Just... Um, but like, like all these Vietnamese and Korean art, it looks like mm. an Asian household, right? And then... My dad, Allah Yerham, had this. Um, he had this foresight of enrolling all of us into Arabic schools because he said, "We live in an Arab country. I don't want you to live as expats. You will learn the language, you will learn the culture, you will integrate into the culture, and you will you will be the culture of the country that we live in." And growing up, I didn't appreciate that. I wanted to be quote unquote cool. I wanted to go to an American or English school. I wanted to. Because I love the arts. I wanted mm. to do something in theater or whatever, which the school that I went to didn't allow me. But 
what I got in return is this the the gift of language. Best gift you, he could have ever given you. Honestly. It is honestly, and now I I see it in retrospect, right? But to answer your question, when I was younger, I I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be as Jordanian as possible so that I fit in with my classmates. Because when you're different, you get picked on. So you kind of try to overcompensate by being really one of the guys in school, you know, mm. dress like them, talk like them, listen to the same music, blah, blah, blah. And then as I got older, um, I would have these conversations with friends where, where my friends would say, you know, I would die for my country. And I, I don't think I would die for any of the countries, you know, mm. because I, just like yourself, I don't belong to a certain place, you know. So in a way, I, I, I don't have that patriotism towards, I love all the countries that I'm from. I don't have that level of patriotism because I feel like I'm a mix of everything. Mm. Uh, but now as I'm older, I, I'm comfortable in my skin. I love that, you know, people like us are third culture kids and we would connect because we are third mm. culture kids. So I think it's an important thing. And I think we live in a world where everybody can be the way they want and they can find the tribe that they like. Uh, as long as, again, you're not hurting yourself or others along the way, just do what makes you comfortable and be comfortable mm. within, with and within yourself. I mean, it's incredible. Like, <clears throat> when you think about it, like, the whole racism and everything, you literally are what you feel. Like, inside and outside can be completely two different, like, juxtaposition of, I wanted to use that word because it's sexy yeah. and cool, of, of things together. Like, <clears throat> kind of reminds me of uh, <laughs> Dave Chappelle's skit, The Black White Supremacist. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, he, he he was blind. He he thought he was white the whole time. Do you know what I mean? He, so how you kind of feel is how you feel, and it, and it's it's strange how you can get people who are born and raised like you could. I'm sure there are black Koreans who are born and raised in Korea, mm -hmm. and they don't know anything else different. Absolutely. I mean, they'd be in the other part of Korea. They wouldn't be in that part, but they know nothing different. Yeah. But yeah, then absolutely. somebody would try to force to them that no, you're not. Because you are this color or you look like that. And it's like, you can't tell me what I am because yeah. it's all I know. Exactly. And I think this is what I try to do with my, with my comedy. You know, I, unfortunately, doing comedy in this region, I have limitations as to which topics I can venture into. So no sex, no religion, no, no politics. Those are the top big three. And you might argue and say, yes, some comedians actually tackle that. but You can't have any of those three either. Yeah, and they, they usually perform abroad, outside mm. the Middle East. Once you start performing here in the language, in the Arabic language, it's a different kind of, uh, it's a different formula. They, mm. It's perceived differently. But what I try to say in my comedy is to, by showcasing our differences, it shows that we're all the same. Mm -hmm. You know, I might laugh at the way somebody has an accent, but I have an accent. Everybody has an accent. So we are all very similar and uh, we all enjoy the same things and... I think racism is just, uh, I, I can't believe there's still racism today. <laughs> Dude, it's insane. Yeah, I, I, I still can't believe it. But I love that we are living in an age of inclusion where a lot of people are being, uh, you know, represented in different mediums. I think that's super important. But we still have some time to go. But it's nice to see that change within our lifestyle, within it, life's life, <laughs> lifetime. It is. But do you think that? Because of the way we, we've been growing up and because we've managed to travel so much and that we look at comedy different or because I just find it really difficult to understand and to comprehend and to get my head around how anyone has the audacity to tell a comedian that he's wrong or you can't say that joke or it's comedy like comedy is it should have a shield where nothing can penetrate if you don't like it you don't like it someone yeah. else does that's fine. But don't come and throw your two cents in and, and, and you know, comedians should be able to say what they like. It's comedy. Yes. That should be, I think, the one, you know, avenue or the one uh, genre that people cannot cancel. A hundred percent. I think, you know, I think comedy is the strongest medium to deliver a message, a serious message. Mm -hmm. And as you said, I think it's, comedians, it's, it's a joke, you know, like mm -hmm. I, I post short form content on social media and it's only designed for social media and it was actually done with the audience's feedback with my followers feedback you know and sometimes people get offended i'm like it's a joke it's insane when i wear a, a wig and, and i play how the, yeah, offended they get they get very offended yeah. and i just 
if they say something that's constructive, I'll leave the comment. If you're just nasty, I'll block yeah, you. Yeah, and if there's something you can learn from as well, and yeah. be like, oh, maybe I didn't look at it like that. I can understand. But even still, like I have a friend of mine, you might know him. His name is uh, Mohanad al Hattab. Of course, yes. So he does Muhammad, yeah. similar yeah. things to you. Yeah. And the amount of abuse that he got, you hate women, you're sexist, you're this, you're that. And it's like, it's clearly the opposite. Yeah. He embraces 19 different types of women. <laughs> Do you Absolutely. know what I mean? And, he, and a lot of women love his stuff. Absolutely. But there will always be that one asshole or the 12 assholes yeah. that find it. And I just find it very, it's a very dark place if you have to, if A, you have the time. B, you have no shame mm -hmm. to go on someone's stuff and say anything negative. Absolutely. Unless it's really, you know, that unless that person is being clearly racist and saying, you know, kill all of this or do that or whatever. But these are just you like know? online trolls, you know, like 99.9% .9 of the time, you go into the account, you visit the profile of the person who wrote this nasty comment. There's no picture, there's no name, mm. there's no posts. They follow seven and a half thousand people. Mm posts nothing obviously very, this very account is created yeah, just yeah. to spread hate you know but where is your life when you have the time or the passion to create that to literally send negative energy <clears throat> out from yourself like, i agree you so must bad. be in such a bad place it must be and you know i've you know i've come to realize that you know whichever kind of person you are at the end of the day you get a bad comment you spend more time thinking about that comment you you scroll mm. through your comments right you'll get a thousand comments all the ones that, I love you, oh my God, great, good luck, hearts. You pass them quickly. One the negative. one negative one, yeah. you stop. And yes, it it whether you admit it or not, it bothers yeah, you. Yeah, for sure. It does bother Much you. more. Maybe for a few seconds, a minute, a day, days, weeks. And I think as time passes, as I'm more comfortable with myself as a person, it doesn't affect me as much because it might affect me momentarily. Mm -hmm. But I look at this person and I look at their account and I see what their account is like and it's clearly been designed to hate on people mm. not just me and i just say listen why do you follow me and hate me if you don't like mm. me you know and, I, and this applies to humans in general you know we're closing in on 10 billion people on earth if i don't get along with you i don't have to see you yeah you know i can pass you on the street and wave to you and that's it we don't have to break bread together and the same thing applies to to social media whether you're on TikTok or instagram or whatever it is there's 1 billion active accounts on Instagram. Mm. You don't like me, go follow somebody else. But it's weird. Sometimes they want attention from the person. I've had loads of mm. friends who have <clears throat> replied to people and then they've like, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I can't believe you replied to me. I, I was just trying to get your attention and, and blah, blah, blah. And that's like, <clears throat> it's crazy. It's honestly, it's a very weird, weird thing. Like I don't read comments anymore. Like, oh, at really? All. No, no, no. Forget it. YouTube comments especially because YouTube is a different monster. Ah, um, okay. And like, so, like I used to, and like I'd get comments like, so I'd have someone on who is, let's just say, you know, uh, the UFC champion spilling his heart out on there. And there'll be a comment saying, wow, that V-neck is, is, re is so low. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It was that choice of V-neck that you chose. And I was like, the guy basically <laughs> told you his life story and the one thing that you wanted to do was to comment on how much of my titties were showing in the video. Do you know what I mean? And I'm just like, where even are you in your life, dude? Like what that's that's what <clears throat> Oh my god. That's it's so, insane. That's <laughs> <laughs> it's insane right it is like insane. that eunuch is questionable <clears throat> i mean it's kind of funny but at the same time it's like what's questionable is you this yeah, guy right? like won the freaking yeah, like yeah, i don't yeah. know olympics ufc yeah. whatever it is but it's 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 funny because uh, for me actually i i do read the comments and um my content for social media has developed a, a new life of mm -hmm. its own guided by people's feedback and comments right so Years ago, I wasn't posting any kind of engaging content because Instagram back in the day was just a place where you post pictures mm. of yourself, right? Yeah, yeah. You, your friends, what you ate today, you know, where you traveled. And then somewhere along the way, it evolved. Yeah. It evolved into like, that's not interesting. Yeah. I don't want to see a picture of you uh, standing in front of the Eiffel Tower. But that was the thing back in the day. Mm. So I stopped posting regularly. I, I would post once a month and my numbers dropped. And then I was like, you know what? I need to find a way to be present but I don't want to do what everybody else is doing. And because people will tell me, Inta, if you just start vlogging your life every day, mm. you'll kill it. 
Mm. But I'm like, well, that's the thing. I don't want to vlog my life. Yeah. I don't want to wake up. There's got to be a myself. separation as well. Exactly. Because already we spend so much time on our phones. So I was thinking of short form content that I can do specifically for social media that doesn't take a lot of my time where I can be present almost daily. And then this is when I came with the idea of um, the joke of the day. And these are jokes that come from this part of the world, the Middle East. And these are jokes you would have heard in the 70s, 80s, or 90s when there was no internet. And that would be your entertainment. Like your parents would have a dinner at home, dinner is done, they have tea, coffee, dessert, whatever. And then they start telling jokes. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, and I like everything vintage. Yeah. I like vintage looking design things like furniture. I love vintage music. I love everything that's old, right? Mm. And uh, I I thought about reviving these jokes on social media, and it was just very simple. You know, I would say, "Hey, today's joke is Arabi. Look at the and whatever the joke is, bye." And that was my way of of being present. You know, people show their their titties and their ass and whatever to get likes. Mm. You know, you can do all sorts of things to get likes. I don't you know? do that anymore. You should have beautiful titties. <laughs> I do have beautiful titties. You do. Like, I can you see know, through right? that shirt. And it's cold here in the see, studio. See, it was you well. who made the comment about the shirt on the YouTube. Now you put yourself in it, right? <laughs> it came out. Yeah, but yeah. You're, the, the neckline is beautiful. Right? <laughs> yeah. I am, to be honest, they are. They have gone a bit higher since since the one since that comment. Oh, they were really? very like, low before. Full, chest, full like chesticles it. before, bro. That's what it was. <laughs> Cover bro. that shit. Yeah, yeah. But um, so I started posting these jokes, and I loved it because it's you know people might find them silly because for anybody who doesn't know what these jokes sound mm. like, they sound like dad jokes. You know, that's the closest thing I can resemble it to. And I started posting these jokes, and they're like five, ten seconds. I show up every day, and they, they were daily, right? Looked at Leon. And then I say it, and then people liked it. You know, mm. they of course people didn't like it. Some people liked it, whatever. But I know people liked it because my numbers grew. I grew like one hundred thousand followers in six months. So wow. clearly, I was doing something right. What I love about that process, and this is going back to reading the comments, because I realized that I started doing jokes that, that require talking. Mm. So the joke of the day is: so the husband said this, the wife said this, the husband said, and it's like it doesn't sound nice. So I'll, somebody said, why don't you act them out? And I'm like, oh, I'm an actor. Yeah. I should act it. And then once we had a birthday party for a friend and we did this, like we got costumes and wigs and whatever. And there was a black wig. I was like, oh, can I take this with me? I can use it for one of my jokes. And it was a short black wig. They were like, yeah, okay, sure. For one of your jokes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you can take it. You don't have to make anything. I like moonlight yeah, yeah. as a burlesque <laughs> yeah, dancer right? on the weekends <laughs> in Bordeaux. <laughs> So I took this wig and I started, I acted the first joke and my numbers were off the roof. They were like at least five, six times more views and engagement than just saying the joke. I was like, oh, I'm onto something. So I started mixing saying the joke and then with acting the joke and clearly there was a winner. So that evolved into a life of its own just by reading the comments, the mm -hmm. constructive criticism or the constructive comments. And then people were saying the wig is too short and it's black and your short is here and black. So the yeah. husband and the wife looked the same so I had to shop for a longer wig nice. and I did a joke out of it where you know I leave the house and I tell my husband me saying I'll be going out I'll be back in a bit with short hair she comes back with long hair nice. and I put the music of like uh, George Michael Careless Whisper yeah. and she's throwing her hair around in slow motion and she's like do you recognize anything different he's like your eyebrows it's like nope eyelashes no nails no I'm like motherfucker I just yeah, yeah, my yeah, hair I, is yeah. different and then that became a thing and then I realized other jokes needed other characters so I involved other characters now there's like husband wife her best friend his best friend the mother-in-law and a reoccurring role for a doctor mm -hmm. and I get to play all these roles and it's like a mini a mini series, mini series yeah, that yeah. I get to do on Instagram and the names for these characters came from the from my followers so oh, I would say, oh, okay. they're like, why don't you give her a name? Why are you always calling her Marti or Zoshti? Mm -hmm. Like, actually, that makes sense. What do you guys think I should call her? Paul. Yeah. And then for, they sent me so many names and I shortlisted them. Vote. And then they chose this one. Okay, this is her name, her best friend. What do you think her name should be? Bum. And they sent me, I swear to you, it was like endless, endless people. That's why my fucking message didn't get in there because all those <laughs> names were in the way, bro. No, I was just ignoring yeah, that. Yeah, right? I was just exactly, ignoring Exactly, it. right? <laughs> but it's yeah. amazing that through, if the tools are being used mm. in the right way, then it becomes something amazing. Instead of hating on me, tell me how I can do things better. Mm. Or if you really don't like me, just unfollow me. But the point of the story is everything that I created, the direction that I'm taking 
is user generated. So mm. and you're building a community as well. Exactly. Yeah. So I think later, if this thing becomes really popular, I can because you always need to up it up, right? Yeah. You do this podcast. Yeah. I think by episode 200 you need to do something special maybe yeah. you change the decor a little bit you change the chairs you're coming back on naked bro that's what i'm doing bro yes <laughs> that's it <laughs> like yes girl let's do it. yeah let's get it take up yeah, yeah. we remove a piece of clothing every episode. every 15 minutes okay sounds good <laughs> it's gonna be a five-hour episode bro. <laughs> i'll wear a lot of bracelets <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah right just one of them you know but that's yeah. that's what's nice you know i think I like reading comments from mm. people because people are genuine. They're like, you made me laugh. Like my mom is sick and these jokes make her laugh. And she would, this girl would always, when she waits for the joke, shows it to her mom and then her mom would laugh and her mom yeah. was very sick. Oh. So I'm like, you know, it's nice that it reaches people that way. Obviously not everybody's going to like it, but if you don't like me, just unfollow me. But they don't. Mute that's me. the weird thing though. Yeah. So that's, I'm like, what are you guys doing? You know, yeah. just, I don't follow people I don't like. And yeah. Also, if it's awkward to unfollow them, mute them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I totally understand it because, I, I mean, I get that sometimes. And again, without sounding douchey and stuff, like when I meet people, they ask me, oh, you got Instagram and blah, blah, blah. And they, they go on it and they're like, oh, you got good numbers here. Yeah. Follow me back. And I'm just like, I kind of only follow my guests mm. and very, very close friends. Like I don't have, I don't follow many people. Yeah. And it's kind of a weird thing to, to say to someone, like, hey, you should follow me back. Mm -hmm. Okay. It is awkward, and I think people right. people need to be taught. Uh, it sounds so patronizing when I say people need to be taught, mm. but I think we need to learn uh, etiquettes of social media mm. because also you cannot go up to someone and ask for their number. Mm. There needs to be a, yeah, yeah, a, a yeah. reason, whether yeah. it's uh, whatever it is, it's a friend or you're interested in somebody, you can't just ask for someone's yeah, yeah. number, and that's what. But Instagram that's what people do now, is, right? right? They, they use Instagram as a way to kind of get in there, even in when, when they're off the girls, they kind of slide into the DMs. Exactly. And if it works, they can move on from there. If it doesn't, they're just like, okay, I'll go to another. I, you know, like I used to be, I'm, I'm honest, right? So like, I would say what you say. I'm like, listen, I only follow like few, a few people or friends or people mm. that I really know. But if you think about that's it, a horrible dick heady douchebag thing to say yeah. like imagine imagine <laughs> someone coming up to you like yeah. listen to how it sounds now yeah so you're just like oh you got instagram yeah oh cool i'll follow you yeah, yeah. and then you're, you're like thanks <laughs> what a dick like it, you know i always there's no nice I way out, i'm like you don't need to follow me you, i know but that's even that's even weird as well because that's kind of saying hey listen you're not interesting enough for me to follow you back yeah so don't follow me. But you know, it's crazy. Like, for example... But it's business. I think we're okay because it's business. This is like... This is my brand. It's not like yes. my personal account. Yes. But for me, it's a bit of both because it's like... It's the only Instagram account that I have and it's partly my la my personal life that I want to show and partly, you know, work and the events that I go to and work mm. that I... The projects that I take on. And... But I also can't follow everybody because... How many projects do I do a year? Mm. I do a lot of projects and every project is different. Sometimes I'm in a movie, I'm in a series, I'm, it's a TVC, it's a social media campaign, it's like a travel show. Yeah, right, you're showing off if, now. <laughs> <laughs> the list goes on, yeah, and yeah, on, on and on and on. But we yeah, don't, have don't have hours. Yeah, yeah. I don't have hours. I've already delegated an hour done. for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Corona. But, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the good part of my allergy, by the yeah, way. Yeah. It was a disaster. Like uh, two, three days ago, mm. I had to go to the hospital again. I'm like, mm. no. I, I went to another hospital and I saw the doctor and I said, listen, this is crazy. I've been coughing and I've been congested for a month and a half. It's, it's crazy. No, but it happens, man. You get these viruses and all that stuff that go around. And but it, it's, it's crazy do. that it lasted this long. I didn't, man. Don't worry. Oh. So anyways, uh, what was I saying? Before Corona lost it two years for us, so it's like, uh, <laughs> it's not that bad. But one thing I did want to ask yeah. you. How difficult is it as a comedian? Because you kind of do have a niche, mm -hmm. which is, it's difficult because I'm sure some some parts of, we, of it, you're like, no, this Arab thing is what made me famous. But at the same time, I don't just want to be the Korean guy that does Arabic because yeah. I'm so much smarter. I, I'm creative. I have all these other things. Did you ever get to a point where you're like, this is kind of limiting me? That's a great question. And yesterday we were like organizing the meetup for today to film. And you asked me if there's anything in particular that you want to ask me. And I'm an open book. You can ask me, ask me anything mm -hmm. you want. But I want to put it out there and say that it's interesting how people always want to pigeonhole you 
as something, you know, like, ah, oh, so it's, you know, AJ, mm. so your podcast. If, you, if you're a wrestler, they want to identify with one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't want you as a wrestler. And, uh, you know, if you yeah. like Tom Cruise, you don't want to listen to Tom Cruise, who's the singer. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. like you want the action star. So people want to pigeonhole you. And I think it's difficult for me as an entertainer because I see myself as somebody who can deliver different art forms, right? I, I have certificates in piano playing. I'm a certified singer. I studied musical theater and opera. Wait, what's a cert- certified singer? So basically, you know how if you're doing piano or guitar, then yeah. you do grades with okay. ABRSM, which is the Associated Board of the Royal Schools of Music in London. So there's okay. two internationally recognized schools that give you certificates that are world worldwide acknowledged that you have you know acquired grade one, two, three, four, five in in piano or guitar. Whatever. But where, where, I mean, where does that work? Where, where, where do you need that certificate? Where oh. you go? I mean, it's surely not like you're doing a gig at a bar and you'll be like, hire me over him because I've got the certificate. <laughs> I got the certificate. <laughs> I got bitches. the certificate, which is, yeah, he's just a karaoke singer, but I'm a, I have a license <laughs> to sing. I'm like the James Bond of the mic world. Like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> no, but it's, so it's not, first of all, it's nice to put it in your, in your okay. office, but also if, if you get to grade eight with the ABRSM system, you are then able to teach. So oh, if you're a guitar, so you can teach me how to sing. I can teach you how to I sing. Do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's very interesting. I need to work on my lab. Right? <laughs> yes. You better see. I can teach you that because I have a certificate in laughing. So I can, <laughs> so loud. I can teach you how to do that. No, but yeah. but it's in, I I love I love singing. You know, and um, I when I did my certificates, they they teach you how to read notes. So if okay. you are a, a certified vocal studies student, then they will give you a music sheet. And mm. you would know you would which know tempo yeah, to read yeah. it. You know the intonations. You need to know the intervals yeah. between all the notes and everything. Quaver. Yeah, yeah. There is a quaver and a semi quaver and, and all these yeah. things. Also good uh, chips. Andy Felice. <laughs> <laughs> I know them all, bro. Okay. I'm not a cert- I dated a certified singer back in the day. Oh, okay. I was like, he knows <laughs> some yeah, yeah, shit, yeah, right? Do you play an instrument? Uh, I do play instruments. Yeah, but self-taught. What kind of instrument? I'm also very good at bumblebee. He bumblebee. <laughs> No, no, I play guitar. You play um, the guitar? Yeah, yeah. Do you read notes? No. Okay. But I can, I, I have a, a thing where I've always um, mm. been fucking awesome at everything. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So, so I can, for example, even a, a piano now, uh-huh. I can't read notes. I can't play piano. Yeah. But if you play me a song, I'll be able to tell you where it is on the piano. I'll be able to recreate that that in. So you would not, recreate okay, the, okay. the melody. Not can buck. you have the the chords as yeah, well? Yeah, not Buck. Uh huh. Okay. But for example, if we had some, I don't know some Coldplay or something. Okay. If you give me five minutes, I'll figure out where it's supposed to be. Okay. Now, will I play it so smoothly and make it sound beautiful and chord progressions and all that? No, but I can I can tell you where it's going to be. Okay. I can play the. <clears throat> What about the chords with the left hand? Would you be able to like yeah, play yeah. the chords with the melody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. But you see, I find that a lot of, um, uh, well. But it, let me just yeah. also go back and say, I'm not good. <laughs> but, I, but I can do it. So for example, we'll, we'll do it one day. I'll, All I'll right. You, you just hum me something and I'll tell you where it is and do it. And I, I can also play Rugrats very good. Rugrats? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I need to see that. Yeah, let's go back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, wh- why am I telling you about the singing? I don't know. Shit. No, no, no. Yeah, we were talking because we were talking about that thing. I can't remember. <laughs> so ba- basically, I did singing, and it was yeah. an interesting thing because, like, with with singing, you need to get the certificates, and you have to read notes when you do the examinations. You would go in; they'll give you a music sheet that you've never seen before, and they'll play the starting note on the piano, mm-hmm. and then you have to sing it in rhythm, in tempo, in in the right time signature, everything. So I've done that and I have all these different art forms that I've done, mm. but people only want to see me as a comedian and and speaking Arabic and speaking Arabic. And, you know, it's funny today I was getting ready at home and I, heard, I got a voice note from my friend who went to the Mo'amar Masjubani show in Abu Dhabi. Nice. And we had a conversation like a few weeks ago and I said, I feel so limited because there are so many things that I want to talk about, but I feel like it will get me into trouble because our Middle Eastern audiences are not West, like worldwide audiences. You know, people get offended here. And she's like, listen. Here? Yeah. Could you do it in America, do you think? But or do you think it's still attached because you I'll live here? I'll tell you here. what the problem for me is. Let's say Kevin Hart comes here and he does a show and he cusses everybody. I mean, I saw it with Dave Chappelle when he came here, he cussed everybody. Right? Yeah. But the difference is- He goes back. <laughs> exactly. Next day he's on flight back. If he gets banned, he doesn't care. He did his show. He took his money. He's leaving. And as a comic, if you if I do a show in Chicago, 
I won't go back for another few years. Mm. You're not going to go back to Chicago to the same audience because you have other audiences. Mm. So that's the difference. I would do a show, I live here. And then that would stop my other stream of income, which is my corporate engagements, my brand associations, my work with you know the government entities, all that stuff. And because I speak Arabic and I perform in Arabic, mm. I'm looked at much more closely than somebody else. You know, you can get up on stage and say, "Yeah, what's up, bitch," mm. and it will pass. Yeah, but but if you said, "Yeah," <laughs> can you? Can you? I don't know if I can say this. But can you? Can, can you, you swear here? Can you say, "Hey, Sharmuta"? Mm. Sharmuta sounds different than bitch. Yeah, yeah, it does. So. I'm I'm held more accountable because I'm speaking in the language of the region, which I respect. I love the language. I love the culture. But it's also limiting for me in terms of topics, um, in terms of a lot of things. Just today, I was thinking maybe I should start doing comedy in English because even when I, I live in Dubai. So when I perform in Dubai, mm. people can be from anywhere. You know, I'm, I'm standing on stage. There's... You know, people from India, from Pakistan, from the Philippines, from the UK, from mm-hmm. Morocco, from Iraq, from uh, Syria, Lebanon, Germany, everywhere. So what's what's the common thread here that everybody speaks English? Yeah, yeah. So maybe I should switch to English. Maybe I should change my my because it's interesting. It makes it easier for me if I was living in Egypt. Mm. It's a hundred million people. They watch the same shows. They speak the same dialect. Mm. They consume the same products. They watch the same TV shows. They are exposed to the same ads so i can say something and they get the reference mm. here in front of 500 people in dubai who is going to get that reference unless my jokes are international yeah about flying about relationships about marriage about owning a pet about mm. you know being in a about driving or something like that but that's very limiting so that's always been something difficult for me to try to 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 navigate because what kind of material do i do so true yeah and i think You, I mean, I think that's why I get away with a lot mm. because they look at me as it's that English guy who speaks a bit of Arabic and he can get away with saying fucking this and that <coughs> and thing. Now, if I was a, a local or an Arab Arab, yeah, they'd be like, and, and I was doing it in Arabic, I couldn't get away with half the stuff, yeah, that, um, and it's amazing, like, because even this this conversation is, is possible because this is a podcast, because this is on YouTube. Mm. If this was done for a network, we can't say half the shit we're talking about, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's. I mean, we can whether we go home <laughs> the next day. That's yeah, but you know, you also want longevity. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, want yeah. to also get corporate yeah. sponsors to your show. You want to have. So it's like really striking that balance between making people laugh and you know, comedy is the more extreme it is, the bigger of a laughter you get mm. because th- the punchline has to be so extreme for you to laugh. But if I'm being mild with my setups, with my topics, with my punchline. But the funny thing is, is. You look at Egyptians, mm. you look at Lebanese, you look at Arabs, they love that rawness. Yeah. And I'm sure if you did do maybe a stand up special that wasn't being filmed, yeah. but a ticket only. Oh, you found your uh, cream. No, actually, you're going to laugh. This is a nail and cuticle cream, but <laughs> I don't have my lip moisturizer and like I'm dry as fuck. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm just going to put it on my lips. <laughs> I think that they, they would really enjoy a private event of you just going raw. In Arabic. I Listen, I agree. However, I'm not creating excuses here, but for me to do that, I need to sit and develop a set. Yeah. Right? So at least 15, 20 minutes of this. Mm. 15, 20 minutes is a lot of jokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need... 15, 20 minutes is an hour set cut down. There you go. Yeah. Like really concise and which you still need to perfect it. But before, and you need to perform it. And yeah, Exactly. Yeah. I'm performing it underground for these audiences. Yeah. Am I getting paid? Mm. No. Once I'm done performing, they all enjoyed it. Can I put it on social media? No. Will corporate hire me and pay me to do mm. comedy for them? No. So it puts me in a, in a predicament because I can't, what I would like to joke about, I mm. can't do publicly. And I might get away with it if I'm doing it in English. But the question now is like all the jokes that I do are in Arabic because that's the audience that I have built up, you know, throughout my career. And mm. I want to continue to create content in Arabic because there aren't a lot of people creating content in Arabic. So should I switch and just do it in English? Mm. I don't know. But and also, the one thing that we've got to give to you is you're not a a token, what's the word I'm looking for? Your comedy isn't funny because you're a Korean speaking Arabic. Yeah. Your funny your comedy is funny because you're a funny Arab. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's one thing. That I think needs to be stated that 
no matter what you look like, your quality of Arabic content is still funny as Arabic content. Yes, yes. So that's the important thing. Yes, thank you for saying yeah. that. But you know, like a lot of times people just see me as the, the you know, the Asian dude who speaks Arabic. Mm. And that's, you know, people come up to you and say, oh, you're gibber. Mm. <laughs> You'd be like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know, you can't, you can try to change people's perception of you. But you know, people, you know, I've realized that people don't pay a lot of attention. You know, people's attention spans are really short. So I'll be filming something in Korea. And back in the day, I would really be very specific with what I'm writing. So I will geotag the place. I would say, mm. today I'm filming my travel show, One Around the World, season two in whatever, Gangnam Garden in Seoul, Korea, and the date. And they're like, oh, nice. Where is this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, motherfucker, just read. It, Dude, it, uh, everything's it's there. insane. So I had uh, a comment. I mean, I've had this about 10 times in the last five TikTok videos. So I would write in the description what the video is about or the name of the person. And then I'd get a comment going, Who's this? Who is this person? <laughs> and part of me wants to go, you dickhead, yeah. read the, 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 it starts with in the yeah. description, the name of the person. Yes. Like, I can't be accountable for your laziness. I can't. I just can't. Exactly. Like, I, it's insane. And I think it's, it's, you know, 20 years ago, when we, they would say, you'll have information available to you at your fingertips, like mm. the world. We have in our hands the most powerful tool mm. ever, ever. This phone is faster than my laptop. Mm. It Soon edits, it will can, be here, it, dude. Yeah, but the information is available to you. Everything you want to know yeah. is right there. You can just, in one second, two seconds. Google. Google. It's there. You know what it is. And it's incredible how everybody buys these phones and doesn't, doesn't use them, use them yeah. for knowledge. But this is what I was telling you. Elon Musk is working on something called Neuralink, mm -hmm. where they're literally trying to patch a computer into your mind. So you can literally Google with your head. But that's... Oh. And I bet you 150% mm -hmm. someone will still go, where is this or what is this? When I go, do this and yeah. figure it out yourself. Like yeah. you're being that lazy. It's in your head. Yeah. It's there. But I think it's it's a nat. I feel like it's a natural human state to be lazy. Yeah. And working hard and learning is something that a few people do. I mean, yeah, but I mean, you can say that about other people, but not a lot of people have a piano and music certificate. So you obviously know the hard work and the graft <laughs> and the singing. <laughs> you know. But you know, people like. You know, I I used to have well, I have kids come and ask me like, mm. oh my god, like, and they would always ask me the same questions like, how can how can we be, be famous like you? And then I have to go on a lecture, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Because I'm like, okay, I'm like, first of all, thank you that you recognize me. Second of all, always remember that fame is a byproduct oh, of something yeah. that you do, right? So you need to be a great actor or singer or a talk show host or an artist, engineer, architect, whatever it is. You're great at that, you will get fame. Mm -hmm. It comes to you, but you need to put in the work. You have to do the rounds first. Yeah, and people don't realize that you really need to pay your dues. You know, you, I'm sure, this is episode number 130. 130, something like that. So yeah. I'm sure at some point, you're Dude, at episode everything's changed. 30, 40, like, oh, is this worth it? Should I keep doing this? Dude, not just that, I look back at a previous episode um, of one of the first couple of episodes. The guests didn't say anything because I interrupted every single thing they said, <laughs> like literally uh, two words in. And there was this really weird thing that I would do that while they were talking, I'd go, yeah, uh, yeah, uh huh, yeah, yeah, uh huh, yeah. And I tried to listen to it back and I, I almost like wanted to quit the whole thing. Like you learn on the way. Like, and especially in comedy, what people don't realize is, I mean, in America, you got the comedy store, you have all these places where people are going and working the door mm -hmm. and literally doing a year's worth of bombing and going on there and trying and trying out jokes. Even the biggest comedians ever, when they do specials now, they run the jokes first and see what they can put in their special by the reactions of the people. By so I'm so glad you said this, you yeah. brought this up, because I try to explain this to people every time I meet them, and I have had a very unlikely foray into the world of stand-up comedy in the region. Mm -hmm. So when I started doing stand-up comedy, I became labeled in 2007 with the Axis of Evil group. I was labeled as the very first Arabic-speaking stand-up comic in the region. And this was on Gulf News. And it was the second page, full second mm. page. My picture, 
title, long text. And I was like, how, how, how am I the first one? Yeah. So I contacted the journalist. I said, thank you for the, for the coverage. But I said, are you sure you can say that? Am I the first? He said, to our knowledge, we've done our research. You're the first one who's doing it publicly in that form, in the form mm. of مش حكواتي, not theater, not a show, mm. not in a, in, in a cafe or like with your friends. To do it publicly, you are the first to do stand-up comedy in the Arabic language. And that was the intention for Showtime back then was mm. to bring stand-up comedy to the Arab world and introduce it with the mm. access of evil because they are of Middle Eastern descent. So when I started doing this, I wasn't an experienced comedian, yet I was put on the biggest stages. Yeah. I, would, I did a month after that, Ahmad Maz and Aaron went back to the US. I stayed here. I started getting all these phone calls to do shows. And every and show was- green as fuck. And I'm like, oh my God. Like, and the thing is with comedy, it's one of those art forms where I think every art form is the same. You need to pay your dues along the way. And I had to learn super fast because usually how it works, long story short, if I were to come up with a new set, I would spend a few months, maybe six months, a year at home writing jokes, 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 jokes. And then you take those, let's say, 100 jokes, you perform them at a comedy club next door, and you get $25 a night. You try these jokes. Out of the 10 or 100, maybe 60 work. So you go back, and you focus on those 60. You expand them. Maybe you added another word or part of that joke that made it funny, and people reacted. You're like, this is a good joke. It needs development. So you take those 60, you go back again, and you do that show with 60 jokes. And then you ad lib. Mm -hmm. And then that's where you start getting By all these accident. flavors. Yeah, yeah. You need to keep doing this for months, if not years, before you perfect a set with a solid number of jokes that have been tried and t tested in different comedy clubs, different venues. And then you know, you'll start getting an instinct yeah, yeah. where this joke's going to work for sure because I've done it so many times mm. and I know how to deliver it. This whole process takes years. Mm. And then you start... Touring the comedy clubs, once you have a solid set, you start touring the country. Mm -hmm. Once you start touring the country, then now you have a very solid 30-minute special. And that's when you can do your... Which came from a two-hour. Exactly. Which you initially thought was a two-hour. Yeah. Exactly. It's like this coffee that's percolating very slowly and it needs time. I didn't have that. So it, it was a double-edged sword. I was getting gigs. I was getting money. I was getting exposure. I was getting put on really big stages. I remember in 2009, I was headlining the Amman Comedy Festival, the Arabic show, and uh, Russell Peters was headlining the English wow. show. And I didn't think I was at the standard to be billed next to Russell Peters. He has worked far longer and far harder than I have, but I have equal billing. And because back then there weren't Arab comics doing that. And I did the show, of course, but I felt like it was a bit of a fast track. And in a way, it's not fair, but in a way, this is the region. Mm. This is how things were back then. Did right? you get any resentment from Arab, local Arab, or maybe other Arab comics that were like, <clears throat> this guy's not even Arab and he's, he's, he's getting all the Arab comic work? I never Because you'll get that in every... I never, from the Middle <clears throat> East, never. Sometimes in when I do shows internationally and I meet international comedians, it's never said, never spoken, but I do get the sense of like, Oh, like how long have you been doing comedy? Oh, back then maybe six years, five years. And they've been doing it for 30 years. And I'm headlining shows. Maybe I'm making more money than them. I have a maybe stronger social media following. So I, I feel like sometimes there's this mm. thing where they, they don't say it. They're like, but you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. he was lucky. Yeah. And yes, to be honest, yes, I was lucky. But the road to success is always a crossroads between preparation and chance mm. if i got the chance but i wasn't prepared then i wouldn't go far although i did not do comedy i was a i was a singer i sang for a long time i played instruments i paid my dues when i was younger so i i studied piano for three years singing for six years with certificates with i sang with choirs i sang with bands pop bands rock bands arabic english bands i sang at christmas carols i, I did mm. everything that i could in jordan and all these years of performing and going on stage and singing with the orchestra or singing with a band or just singing with the guitar or singing with the piano, all this allowed me to get up on that stage that night in Jordan and sing Gan Al Hawa Abdul Halim Hafiz. And they're like, oh my God, he sings it so well. Given that 
Arabic singing is not my forte yeah, yeah. because al-ghana shari is different from mm-hmm. opera musical theater. So I, my forte is singing like musicals and opera and arias and you know jazz and things like that. That's what my voice is suited for. And I think that's what gave me the 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 comfort of going on stage and being able to command that stage because I am a singer. Mm. I did singing for a long time. So when I got up on stage and I sang, they're like, oh my God, how is Arabic? How is he talking Arabic? And he's singing too. And he's like, yeah, because I worked on it. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't like and They random. didn't see everything that's, they exactly. always just see the finished product. So I had it. all this prep to be a stage performer to, my trajectory was musicals. Mm. So that was what my voice teacher trained me to do. Because if you're studying classical voice, you're doing either opera, classical, or musical theater. Because that's the voice you need for those mm. genres of music. And that's what I was being prepped for. So it was years of studying acting, singing, working on my diction, working on learning songs in Italian, in German, in French. So that skill set somehow allowed me to do comedy. Mm. I just had to add, you know, like comedy elements. And by the way, Ahmed, Maz, and Aaron helped me with the jokes. Because when I went up on stage the first time, I said, I have no jokes. And they said, you know, just write one joke and we'll help you shape it into a setup and a punchline. What was your first ever joke? It was a situation where I, I was working at NBC, the TV network, and I had just started work or I was visiting before I was employed. And I went up the elevator and I had a mohawk back in the day. And two Saudi guys went in and they said, Yaqi, talla hada, shif sha'ru kif. Like a hedgehog. Yeah, yeah. So I turned to him and I said, <laughs> <laughs> And it was a real situation, but they I said this to the guys, they laughed, and they they helped me turn it into a little joke, like a bit of a setup, kind of like set the scene, yeah, yeah. this, what they looked the like, yeah. and then a punchline. And that's what I did. So and they told me, This is your job. So that was joke number one. And I said, What am I gonna do tomorrow? They said, Tomorrow you're gonna bring to us another joke. And we will tell you how you can turn that into an actual stand-up joke on stage. Yeah, yeah. So by day two, I had two jokes. Day three, I had three jokes. Wow. By the end of the tour, I had 30, 30 jokes. 30 jokes, yeah, one for each day. So I had a 15-minute th- set, and I was helped by professionals. They would take a situation or a joke that I created and help me tailor make it into a stand-up comedy joke on stage. You were very lucky. I was. I was very, very it's, lucky. It's like... Every element that was needed was put into place. You know, like for me, even if it was by chaos or whatever, but it was literally like <clears throat> being put to the wolves. Yeah. But also, you had weapons there. Luckily, you had you know a net. You had this and that. Like you know, through Moa Maz and yeah, and all that. That it st- could have been a lot worse. You could have had the the OSN guy going, and and it could have not been Exes of Evil going. Yeah. You're quite funny. We want you to do this, and you just going up there trying to figure everything out as you go along, which would have been a disaster. You know, it's funny because at the beginning of this interview, I told you how I was discovered in a shoe store, but I didn't want to expand on that story because it's quite long. Mm-hmm. But to answer your question, you said I, in a way, the stars aligned for me. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll tell you that story now. Actually, I'll try to summarize it as much as I can. So we know that the Access of Evil comedy tour happened and I was part of it. Before that, there are two parallel roads, Right. I didn't know the head of production at Showtime. Neither did he know me. We started the tour in November 2007. This was January 2007, way before. My friend calls me and he says, there's a flash sale at Puma. Just for one day, you can pick up any pair of shoes for 100 dirhams. And back then, it was like a dream to Mm. pick up a pair of Puma sneakers for 100 dirhams. So I went up to my boss at work and I said, listen, I'm taking half day off because I need to buy sneakers. I was like do as you please let me go with whatever or take half day off or take one day leave off i don't care i'm leaving i went to the puma store the sales guys were from our part of the world so they were like palestinian jordanian lebanese syrian so i know since i was a kid that as soon as i start speaking in arabic they mm. gravitate towards me and i get professional treatment and i get discounts and i get mashallah Arabi zayna. Mm. Immediately. And I used to avoid getting to fights with people on the streets because I would walk down the streets in Jordan and I would hear them say things like, oh, Jabanizo el Abtizo, Jabanizo el Abtizo. <laughs> and I'm like, this could turn really bad. They can jump me and have a fight with yeah. me. I would turn that into a, 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 a positive, a positive yeah. situation by turning to them and saying, Salamu alaikum, kam is mm. 
ساعه ما شاء الله ساعه واحده بس ما شاء الله عليك بتحكي عربي سو انا بليز اي وانت بلاي تاع بليز انا بس اي وود تشينج ا سيتويشن فروم ذيم بيينغ اجريسيف توردز مي تو لايك ذيم بيينغ ماي فريندز اند وانتينغ تو نو يو يس جست باي سبيكينغ عربيك ذير لانجويج So I have used this all my life. So I use it to get discounts as well. So anyways, I was making people laugh. There was this guy who works at Showtime Arabia. He saw me. He took notice, but I didn't think much of it. He goes back to his office at Showtime. Now they're watching. They're prepping the Access of Evil tour in the Middle East. So they pop in the, the Access of Evil DVD that they had done for Comedy Central. And it was the first full Middle Eastern cast to have a Comedy Central special. So they start watching it. This is the whole team at Showtime organizing this tour. And they hear that joke that says, we are called the Axis of Evil. We are an Egyptian, a Palestinian, and an uh, Egypt, Egyptian, Palestinian, Iranian. We're looking for North Korean to complete the Axis of Evil. And they got a big laugh. Light bulb. Light bulb moment. So he pauses it and he says, wouldn't it be great if we found a North Korean to complete the Axis of Evil? They've been saying this for years. And they're like, man, how the hell are you going to find a North Korean anywhere outside of North Korea that's still alive? He's like, I know a Filipino guy that speaks Arabic. Great. <laughs> Not, he didn't know me, right? Yeah, yeah. I didn't think about yeah. Oh, so he didn't know me in person. But he said, you know what? Today is the craziest thing. I saw this Chinese guy <laughs> at the mall and he spoke fluent Arabic and not any Arabic, Jordanian Arabic. His producer is a friend of my ex-colleague. And once I went for coffee with my colleague, When I used to work in public relations, we went to have coffee and that friend came. She's her best friend. So we had coffee together. And she was like, oh my God, years ago. Now she works as a producer for this head of production. Wow. So when he says a Chinese guy, Chinese guy speaking fluent Jordanian, it clicked in her head. She said, wait a minute, short guy with a mohawk. And he said, yes, that's him. She said, no, no, he's not Chinese, he's Korean. And that's when they both have that light bulb moment. Mm. So she gets my number from my colleague and calls me up and says, um, hi, I'm so-and-so from this network and we would like to meet you. Back then it was my dream to be on television. So that call was like, what? A TV mm. network is calling me, they want me to work? I went and I met them. It was her, the producer and the head of production. We sat for dinner and they said, just speak in Arabic. And I just spoke to them in Arabic. They were both mesmerized. And this is, was January, 2007. So they had a camcorder. Mm-hmm. So he put it on. He's like, do you mind if I film you? I said, no, go ahead. He said, please just say anything in Arabic for one minute. I said, ask me a question and I'll answer you. So he said, uh, what was the last movie you watched? And what did you think about it? So I gave him a full review in Arabic. The film is Bale, Mate, Hadro, Mishtab, I said, I'm going to have a DVD or whatever. I'll have a DVD, I'll have a DVD, I'll have a DVD, I'll have a DVD, but I'm going to have a DVD cinema. He took that tape. He sent it to Los Angeles. to the agent of the Access of Evil comedy tour uh, group. And he put a label on that tape that said, I found your Korean. Wow. Yeah. So they called him, the Access of Evil guys called him. They're like, where the hell did you find this guy? He's like, I just randomly, I saw him at the mall. The stars aligned. The stars aligned. And they called me up and then they brought me in to be a presenter for the show. And then I traveled with them thinking that I would only be a presenter. And th- this was the plan. Four hours before the first show, they said, we want you to be part of the show. And that's when we planned the whole thing. I sang the Abdul Halim Hafiz song. Yeah. I did one joke. Yeah. That same night, I had people lining up to take my autograph. Wow. I, had, um, I used to work for NBC and I had quit my job at NBC seven days prior to going on tour. I quit to join this tour. And my colleague who was a presenter for NBC One News was there. She interviewed me. Wow. It went on TV that night. They got thousands of emails the next day saying, who's this guy? Like, we need to know more because... There was uh, no backstory. You just no backstory. threw this bomb on us and you're not even telling us anything about it. The next day, NBC called me. They're like, we want you to go live with us via satellite. We're allocating 15 minutes for you on the primetime news, nine o'clock news, NBC mm. One, to talk about your life and talk about what you're doing with this tour. And this tour was changing stereotypes and everything. And because the guys didn't speak any Arabic, I was the front Mm. I was the official spokesperson who spoke on their behalf in Arabic and I did that and this was the second day performing so first day mm. second day was NBC interview via satellite from Jordan the, I left the studio and then my boss tells me get ready for are you ready for show number two I said 
yesterday was crazy. Mm. I can't believe I left NBC a, a week ago. Now I'm doing this. I have people lining up to take my autograph. Now, day after, I'm, I'm live on satellite on NBC One's primetime news. He said, get ready. Tonight, the entire royal family is coming in Jordan. Wow. King Abdullah, Queen Rania, and the entire royal family booked the first two rows. And I performed and sang for them two jokes this time because it was the second day. Mm. And then it just kept snowballing from there. But to go back to how you said, you didn't say the stars were aligned, but I, I will say to you, the stars were aligned for me because anything could have gone wrong that wouldn't mm -hmm. have been, that wouldn't have taken me to where I am today. If I didn't go to the mall that day, if my boss didn't give me the time off, mm -hmm. if I felt hesitant to not leave the office that day, if the guy from Showtime wasn't buying shoes at that time, we only crossed paths for mm -hmm. five minutes. If Everything that, happens for the specific reason, specific it does, time, dude. It does. And I'm, I'm happy that before that mm -hmm. moment, I had spent a lot of time, you know, investing myself in the arts. I went, did a lot of theater work because if you study singing, vocal studies, they, they put you out of, a, in a musical ensemble. Mm -hmm. So you get to act, you get to sing with other people. And that's what I did for a long time. Mm -hmm. So that's why the, the, the cameras don't, don't make me nervous. People don't make me nervous. The stage doesn't make me nervous. But it's a lot of time and effort that I've put into this, a lot of money, a lot of hard work for me to be able to study acting, sing, to you know, be able to stand and project my feelings and my, 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 whatever, my voice, my expressions to the world. But I also had the stars aligning for me mm. to be part of something that became so successful that was a launching pad for my career. But to summarize it from my side, I think if you do things with the intent of your heart, of the things that you really want to do, and you do things honestly, genuinely, you follow the things that you want, one day your opportunity will come. It may have not come my way in 2007, but it may have come later. Maybe somebody would have seen me singing in a karaoke bar, maybe mm. singing uh, a song in Arabic, and they would have recognized me and said, hey, come and... By the way, I auditioned for Arab Idol, which was Arab superstar Idol. back then, because yeah. I always tried everything. Mm. And I was I made it second round, they rejected me. I auditioned for another reality show called Al Andali Man Yughani, which was, they were looking for a Abdul Halim Hafiz voice person. And yes. I went and I auditioned. I didn't make it. But people don't see how many yeah, times. They don't see how many times you have to fall down first before exactly. you Exactly. And then luck came out of nowhere. It's like the content you post on social media. We talked about this. Mm. You post 100 videos. One day, the video that you maybe put the least effort in goes viral. Yeah. And you don't know why. But you just have to keep trying. It's consistent, man. Yes. Consistency with everything in life. I mean, what we can get from that, moral from that whole story is never let your Arab cheapness stop you from doing things because of his it was his quest for a discount because he's an arab and because he was looking for that quest to save money that kicked off his whole career my salary so was six the, and a half thousand see, dirhams the, like that the inner arab in you the quest for a discount which we all have you're born with that as arab as arabs we're born with genitals and a quest for discount yes and a haggle i'm about to save money yeah yeah that's incredible dude no but it's 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 so like I love. I don't. I love it because it's not because it's my story, but it is a story of like. Comp I remember a friend of mine when I left Jordan. She mm. sent me two friends actually, and the one is now a very famous opera singer. The other one is someone who does events. So they're both like very artistic people. This one sent me a message saying, um, "You're destined to be a star, and you will." The other one told me, you were born under a lucky star, so you will get the good fortune. Are your friends shaped like fortune cookies? Is my what? Are your friends shaped like fortune cookies? Do you have to break them first before they One of them is Chinese. You have to break it's her from Chinese. the center. You, you take just, her stands paper, like this, right? You and you break her. You take her out. You read the paper. You have a good fortune. He said that. I was going to do the same joke, but I think it, it, it settles a lot better if it's coming from like that face than my one. Yeah, it's my region. It's because my, my accent is I, very good. <laughs> but in the day of work, in this day of workness, I won't do it at all. Yeah, but, I won't do it. Yeah. You know, but I think... I, I'm someone who really believes in, in energies and, you know, I read mm. my, my star side readings and everything. Even my sister, Suni, mm. yeah, who's yeah, friends yeah, with your wife, sure. she, she introduced me to this, uh, this thing where you kind of read your fortune and it's not like in a, like an abracadabra no, kind no. of way, but it's just Mercury's in its uh, anus retrograde. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 More Corona. Yeah. But 
I love and I I really love astronomy, right? Yeah. And astrology is based on astronomy. So when you have, you know, uh, if our communication systems are 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 acting up, it's usually a solar flare that affects yeah, yeah. our ways and Google Maps and whatever. That's why your lips are so dry today. Is because uh, fucking dry Venus now, is. My God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. gonna go to the pharmacy and buy <laughs> yeah. some like Vaseline or something. No, no, I totally agree because the universe is so much more connected to us than people understand, dude. Absolutely. I mean that's a whole other episode, but yeah. you know when you go down to the the Fib- Fibonacci spiral and you start breaking down vibrations and everything, the the maths behind Earth and the universe, the specific speci- specificity yeah. of it, it's incredible. Like you couldn't make it up. Dude. Abs- I mean I agree with you a hundred percent because that's what you feel when you meet somebody, and you know you're like oh my god they get along so yeah, well. Yeah. And it's like it's that energy, it's that even, frequency. Yeah. You vibrate to the same frequency. Even gut, dude. Like what the fuck is gut? Yeah. Something happens in life. You're walking and then you look down a road and you go, not today, my friend. And you carry on walking. Like that's a very specific, strange kind of, you know, voodoo-y kind of thing. But it's right. It's, it, it's, it's right. Because listen. you do go down that road and then you walk out like that and yeah. going, yeah. <laughs> and you knew those guys were up to no good. Do you know what I mean? But like your body does, does sometimes tell you, or you, you know, sometimes when you meet someone and they're portraying something and you go yeah you're not fooling me at all yeah i can see through that yeah. i can smell the bullshit yeah, yeah you're not and but other people won't see it but you'll just be like no nah. yeah. <laughs> yeah you know but i think i don't know i don't know what to i i feel like i my senses are mm. awake when i'm some with somebody and i try to be as honest as possible all the time i i i, I know sometimes in business you can't be that honest yeah, yeah, and, for sure. but i i appreciate honesty so much and i love when i meet somebody and they speak the truth even if it hurts a little bit i was like you know what? that's a good friend to have because you need to surround yourself with those people yeah, who tell sure. you what's wrong and what's right and for you to do the right thing and you know again the the energies of the universe and the energy that you know whatever stimulates or sparks your gut feeling whether it's good or bad these are all real you know the the moon creates waves mm-hmm. it, it ebbs the dragon, and flows the pool, it yeah. creates uh, wind it creates all these things Mate, the tides <laughs> like that alone right and yeah. all these other planets that are made out of different irons whatever yeah. they affect us when they're aligned in a certain way they affect the iron in your body as well so you behave mm-hmm. in a certain way so I, I believe in that stuff and i think you know I, I follow that and somehow when i let myself flow with the the, the feelings that i have with the energy that's presented mm-hmm. to me I feel like it takes me places. Yeah. And again, as long as you're not hurting yourself or hurting others, just kind of keep trusting your gut yeah, and yeah, for working sure. for it. For sure. Dude, is there anything that you feel like we missed out? Because I know that you have chosen someone else other than me because <laughs> you, you, you have a time limit today. They're sending but you messages. We, we, we'll, uh, we'll literally be, we'll do this again for sure, 100%. You know, yeah, we need like five is, hours. My house is your house and I hope your house is my house so I can go no, show no, no, people let's my, keep music, your house my music my certificates on the wall it. and shit. Like, no, I might need to tell people about my singer certificate so I might need the key so I can go, I also have these. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? But if there's anything you feel like uh, you missed out for, for this episode, because we will do a part two. Oh my God. We might even start a new show together who knows oh who knows who knows man um you know what i've there's so much more that i can talk about and i well it's you who decided that you have to go to dinner with your friend (laughs) football friends we can let let me hear what my friend is saying hold on let me see what the voice is saying he's taking his headphones off and everything okay yeah but you know that everyone's gonna hear this right (laughs) habibi i'm gonna have to keep them entertained otherwise how are they doing with time? What's he reading? You saw it al How long is this uh, voice note? Okay. Yeah, they're like, oh, everybody was hungry. But I told them to have a snack so we can eat together. Okay. So okay. I need to leave soon. All right, but we can um, We can do another, like, we can we can wrap it up nicely if you want. Yeah. Let's wrap I, it up. I, I talk a lot, so. Dude, you know me. I would have done a three-hour episode. I tell you what. Imagine if I don't <laughs> have allergies. Imagine. Let's, uh, let's. Something, did you watch Chris Rock's new special? No. No? No. Oh, come on, dude. Why not? You know, I have this, it's it's a very strange thing because I, people ask me, did you watch Game of Thrones or this? And I love watching documentaries. Okay. I love learning about the world we live in. I feel like there's so much that I can learn. And by watching something that is fictitious, mm. I don't learn. But about- I mean, as a comedian and after the Will Smith thing, I, I would have thought, See, that's the Will Smith, after the Will Smith slap, that's what interests me. 
there's also a part of me that when I started doing comedy, I didn't want to watch other comics. Yeah, I get that because of, because you know what it takes and you can't really judge somebody else's set because you know what goes into it, right? And what's what's worse is you start picking up your ma their mannerisms, mm. right? So if you're watching an Eddie Murphy, mm -hmm. you start doing his hand gestures and whatever. And you, I don't think you fully develop your own voice. And maybe this is something I've learned with my years of singing because, mm. you know, I used to always try to sing like the recording and I would go to my voice teacher and try to sing the song in the way that that singer sang it. And she mm. said, no, don't push your voice that way because you're not, your vocal cords, are your, your physicality is not designed like that singer. Mm. So you will sing in a different way. So I try to apply this maybe subconsciously into my comedy. So I really try to stop watching other comics, try to do my own thing, try to develop my own jokes, have my own voice. And then, you know, and then by trial and error, by going on stage several times, you start developing this, mm. this sense of who you are, how you like to stand, how you like to pace the stage, mm. how you hold your microphone, how, you, how close you are to the people. So all these things are things that come by just doing it. And I think I still have this in me where I don't watch a lot of other comics. Um, also because I feel like there was a time when I was always watching I was always going to comedy shows. So somebody like Mo Amr, I've done shows with him in Jordan, joint shows. I've seen him perform many times. Maz, I can probably lip sync his set. Yeah. If he was sick or something and he needs an understudy, I can be a Maz Jubani. So yeah. Ahmed and Aaron. And I feel like when you're surrounded by so much of this, I don't watch comedy when I'm at home. I mm. watch like other things. So I'm, I'm more of a serious person, uh, content watcher. Like I watch a lot of educational stuff documentaries about the world i've got some youtube rabbit holes that i'm gonna send you down don't worry i'm please, gonna send you down them please yeah. but like I, I like to watch real things and mm. it's it's very rare that things really capture my attention when they're fictitious now i want to watch i get it everything anything all at once oh you have not seen that no because it got so much attention and because ah, it's an it's an see, Asian I, see I, I watched it pirate before it got, ah, before it got all the attention definitely so I was the people, huh? yeah, yeah. i'll give you a website Okay. Top, top quality <laughs> hd hd everything wonderful yeah, yeah. wonderful um, i think the interesting thing about chris rock's thing though is that he did it live which i thought was very interesting it wow. was streamed live his special wow so, you have to be and that's an it's an hour set it's not, <laughs> only somebody like chris rock can do yeah. that you <clears throat> and had the will smith part in it as well so didn't want to get that part wrong as well right so but you know i think it's like somebody who plays the piano right mm. so if you read notes and you're practicing a Nocturne 3 by Chopin on the, on the piano, you get to a point where you are so good. Yeah, it's muscle memory, right? It's your fingers are just going to do it anyway. Exactly. I mean, one of the top... So there's a, a Chopin piano competition that takes place, I guess, in, in Poland or something, maybe, or maybe in the US, but it's only people who... Play, pianists who play Chopin. Mm. And Chopin is a very difficult yeah. uh, you know, uh, composer to play, to, to play his music. And the guy who wins a lot of these awards is, is a Japanese guy who's blind. Wow, yeah. He's completely blind since the age of three. I get it totally though, because blind people, they see things different, literally. Yeah. They see things differently. Because there's one of my favorite musicians, his name is uh, Raul Midon. Okay. And he, he's Mexican, he's blind. Yeah. He plays guitar, makes it sound like there's three guitars, also does a trumpet from his mouth. Oh my God. And he's doing like seven things at once. But I think... Being blind opens up your ears in a way that we will never understand. Absolutely. But to the other dimension of this where you are so good, if you are a Chris Rock and you know you can do that, mm. then you know you are the, the you are the one of the best. Because mm. I, I, I love singers. So recently I went to Abu Dhabi to watch a few of these big artists perform. So a few days ago was Gregory Porter, who is a two-time Grammy-winning jazz artist who has won best jazz album of the year twice. Oh. Uh, somebody like Juan Diego Flores, who's one of the most important operatic voices. Jahida Wahbe, who's a Lebanese singer who I feel is very underrated. She's one of the best vocalists out there. And I go and I meet these people because I'm a huge fan. And these are people maybe a lot of people don't know, but they are some of the best. And I always ask them because I meet them, right? And I'm like, do you have a certificate? Because I have a certificate in uh, music. I'm like, how do you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you have this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm like, how, how how do you not make a mistake? I w went mm -hmm. to their concert for two hours. They're singing. They don't put a foot wrong, not even a finger wrong. I'm like, how? How? But they know, and mm -hmm. they can even sing it. Sing when they wake up and they sing because they know their instrument. They know what they're doing. And I think 
Same thing with Chris Rock. For him to be able to have the balls to do a full hour live, live stream, I'm like, did you have an opinion over the Will Smith thing? Well, the thing is, Will Smith is a Libra, uh, okay. so am I, and I understand the anger that he has that that he built up to that moment because it wasn't a good year for him i'm not by the way i'm not justifying what he did but as a libra i understand how he thinks because we tend to bottle things up mm. for so long and then one day it's gonna pop and then you'll be a very unlucky person to be in the face mm. of someone who's a libra who has been bottling all these emotions up and it was a really bad bad call judgment call on will smith's side because yeah he was facing a lot of issues with his wife i'm sure there's a lot of like fights with, between him and jada and then something sparked it for him for him to go up and do that in front of the world to see he must be out of his mind but to, do to that. chris rock as well i mean he's a he's a world treasure <clears throat> yeah. to be honest you know what i mean i feel like if it was it could have been a lot of other comedians where but, it wouldn't have been the, like the level of respect <clears throat> i just feel like Chris Rock is, you know, but for yeah, I mean, me, like I, he's one of the giants. No, you shouldn't do that to anybody. Mm. You should not slap anyone in the face. No, no, for sure. <laughs> yeah. It's like no, period. no, for sure. But I mean, like I just, <clears throat> nah. For me, yeah, it's all right. It's not right. You know, for me, I always say this. Like you know, I in my real life, I might say shit, fuck, motherfucker, and all that stuff. I cuss a lot, mm. but when I'm angry, I never use that language. I would never say fuck you if I'm mm. upset with you. If I start speaking to you in a different language, when I'm, you know I'm upset with you mm. because I don't go there. I don't, I, I don't bring down my level when I'm upset mm -hmm. and I say things that I don't mean. I'm a Libra, so like I, I'm, I'm calculated about how I'm going to address how you hurt me or how you did this to me, but I will never use foul language. I use it for fun, but not for serious stuff. No, no, I totally get you because I'm a Leo, which means yeah. I'm better. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, yeah. my, my, uh, my, Descending is Leo, so that's why we get along. So when you do a shit, <laughs> yes, it's I think Leo. Of you. Is that what you're saying, right? You're descending, right? It's Leo. But you know that, right? Yeah. You know, you're rising and you're yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so my rising is Aquarius. I'm a Libra. My descending is a Leo. So when I read so my you're stars, horny, you're you're a <laughs> Aquarius, but when you're shitting, you're a Leo. Okay, I get it. I get yes. it. I get it now. See, you just have to put it in layman's terms so people understand. <laughs> exactly. So if you do ever do any, you know flirt with anyone, you can just be like, it wasn't me. It was it was the Aquarius. You know AJ, I mean? you bring out the worst in me. All of your male friends, um, we'll, we'll end it like this, must be really happy with your name. My God, it's comedy gold. You it know? is, right? When we did the Axis of Evil comedy tour, there was a we filmed it for a TV show, and I put out this idea where we should... Uh, because <laughs> I put out this idea of calling it the Axis of Evil comedy tour. Three guys and one hoe. Okay. And initially, management said, no, we can't do that. I said... It's my name. Well, it's my, yeah. You can't say no to my name. It's my name. And we, we got away with it. And then I subsequently, I did um, press style junket uh, talk shows with, with guests for my network. Mm -hmm. So I would meet the cast of Lost, Grey's Anatomy, Ugly Betty. Mm -hmm. And the show was called One on One. So W-O-N oh, okay, on, on One. one. Yeah. And then I realized there's so many things that could be done with my name. Although it's, I didn't realize it sounded weird until i went to the us for the first time and people would ask me what's your name and i'd say one ho and they're like oh where's the other ho yeah I'm like oh i never thought about it that way and now it's a thing so i'm like you know i'll make jokes about it on stage i think it makes me interesting the name one ho in korea is not very common it's a very old oh, name so it's uh, not even in korea it's common no yet. because i i remember when i what, had, does it, what does it mean always brave always brave which is true well, most most percent of the are. time <laughs> most, are, most hoes are always brave to be honest the stuff that they could it should be i should name myself to whatever the equivalent yeah. of in korean is sometimes brave or yeah, yeah, occasionally yeah. or tries to be brave most of the Mate, time look it's good to it's good to have you as a friend because at any time even if i feel like you know it's come to that part of my relationship and i do want to cheat then, then uh i'm asked where are you going i'm just, I'm just going to see one hoe <laughs> At least I was honest. Do you know what I mean? I told you I was going to see a hoe. <laughs> you assumed it was him. <laughs> okay? That's not my fault. Yeah. It was straight honesty. I told you I was going. I was going to see one hoe. 
and that's what happened i love it <laughs> dude I love um it. thank you so much for coming we I, I literally don't want to make you too late we've done the, uh, an hour and a half and i know that you're really hungry right now i can see you it's either licking your lips because you're really hungry or it's because you don't have the lip cream <laughs> they're just dry or it's because <laughs> or it's because the energy is right and and the mercury is retrograding around us maybe maybe but again you're more than welcome to come back anytime thank you my house is your house thank and you. i do have the keys to your house yeah <laughs> um, I'll, I'll make you a and, copy and send it to you uh, you have any parting words for anyone it will be in that camera right there. <sighs> I don't know. I hope this was <laughs> somewhat entertaining. I hope you got to know me a little bit. Um, I was telling AJ that this is my, the first time that I ever do a, a podcast, that I'm a, a guest on a podcast. I, I love this medium, and uh, I wanted to do one myself, actually. I've been thinking about it for a long time, but it, it is it is quite nice because it feels intimate, yet people get to mm. sit in on this like conversation, kind of eavesdrop on what we're talking about. I hear you in my ear and yeah, the yeah. sound is so good. And I like this extended time that we have to talk about things because I'm a talker. I love talking. And I feel like a lot of my answers need, you know, a lot of the questions need time long to elaborate. answers yeah, yeah. from yeah. me. So I think thank you for giving me the, the opportunity and the space and the online space to, to talk about all the shit that I wanted to talk about. No, I appreciate you, dude. Um, and again, it's a, uh, it's your house. Anytime you want to come and do something, we'll do it. Guys, I hope you enjoyed it. I've been AJ. He's been one of my hoes. And uh, <laughs> boom. <laughs>